It's a pleasure to be up here in a serious society where you think about things, pay attention, read books. Uh, there's a great deal of ground to cover tonight, uh, and uh, I'm going to probably rush through a couple of parts of this talk, which is more or less, this is my standard university talk, but, but actually it's, it's even shorter than the standard university talk, but I'm going to compress it further, um, because I want to get on to the, the issue of uh, what we're going to do, because that's the most important part of this. The most impressive part of the situation at the moment is our failure to construct a coherent consensus about what's happening to us and what we're going to do about it. And I think it's pretty similar uh, in the USA and in Canada. I, I understand that we do have some cultural and even economic differences. And, and obviously, I'm speaking from the point of view of somebody who's from the USA, and, and I uh, expect you will understand that as we go along and understand the things which may more or less apply to you or not apply to you, okay? So we get that. A, a very interesting thing happened in the last couple of years. Those of us who were paying attention to the larger set of problems, that what I have called uh, the converging catastrophes, um, many of us expected that the trouble would start in the energy sector, really, the, the bad trouble. And it turned out that we destroyed the banking system first. <laughs> and we really did a good job of doing it. Um, one of the things we've discovered is that even if we were to, uh, re, to, to ramp up once again the great consumer-led uh, sh uh, shopping fiesta uh, and happy motoring uh, nirvana, that even, even if we did that, when we, got, when we started bumping up against the $75 a barrel ceiling, uh, the economy would start wobbling again, and if we actually penetrated that above that, the economy would start collapsing again. So we're faced with this problem that the kind of growth that we've been used to for ages, whoop, um, I see my lettering has, you might, we, this might crop up again. Sometimes when you take a show off a of zip drive and put it on a computer, the lettering gets messed up. Mixed, messed up. Um, we, um, one of the main implications of the current situation is that, that um, we may not be able to see the same kind of economic growth that has become normal for us over, for generations now. And that our, uh, our financial system as we know it, our, and what I prefer to call our system of capital, will not uh, uh, be able to th flourish and thrive or even maybe continue to exist under those circumstances. By the way, you know, I don't refer to capitalism as, a, I don't consider capitalism a belief system. Um, and I don't think it has anything to do with belief and I think that it's a mistake to treat it that way. Especially as if it was the antithesis to something called communism. For me, capital and capitalism is simply uh, a set of laws governing the behavior of surplus wealth. And I, you know, I don't think that it makes sense to inveigh against surplus wealth because it will probably always exist. And, and by the way, this system of capital also includes the very important question of how we are going to deploy surplus wealth in the service of productive activity. Okay? What we did in the last mm, 10, 20 years in the United States increasingly was to deploy capital in the service of unproductive activity. And here's sort of why. There was a combination, a strange convergence of um, events that happened. One was uh, that we began to understand that the conventional investment instruments like stocks and bonds really were not producing wealth over time. You know, if you, if you look at the Dow Jones, for example, um, uh, when you factor in inflation, it's hardly produced any uh, wealth at all in the last uh, 10 years. So what's happened, I think, in recognition of that was that people in the banking industry decided to create a whole body of new financial instruments, of mutant Frankenstein instruments, that would produce wealth in a new way. And that new way would be getting something for nothing. 
The old instruments got, got uh, 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 accumulated wealth <clears throat> from, from investing in productive activity, which produced things of value. The new Frankenstein uh, securities were, were designed to just produce uh, something for nothing, and they failed. Because they all turned out to be two things. Uh, and these are two words that have not been used in connection with this situation hardly at all, and it's important for you to start employing them. These, these uh, securities turned out to be swindles and frauds. And they destroyed the banking system. And so we are now, the banks choked on all the bad debt that they created on the something for nothing, in the something for nothing financial sector, and now they're dead. The bottom line for all of this, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm rushing through this, but because it is fascinating and morbid. It's, it is sort of a horror story. The bottom line is that a tremendous amount of wealth is now flying out of the system into a black hole from which it will never emerge again. It will never come back. It will not be there to do the things that we hope that it would be there to do, namely to build a new economy to build a green economy, to invest in new ways of, of uh, uh, living and working in North America and in the advanced world generally. So this money is not going to be there, and um, that's the money that we had hoped would go into deploying the windmills and the, the um, uh, alternative energy, etc. Well, these people are laughing because, not only because they ate our lunch in the United States, but because our Secretary of the Treasury told, us, told them that their investments with us were safe. <laughs> and your neighbor for, to, the, to the south is, is now, has now become this sort of pitiful, homeless person who comes up to you, he doesn't smell very good, comes up to you at the entrance of the, you know, the subway and he asks you for money, and that's us now. All right, that's, that's the very, very short financial part of the story. The oil problem, and this is largely from the point of view of the USA, so forgive me for presenting it this way, but I think it'll help generally maybe shed some light on where we're at and what's happening. Um, this is the old theory, the old model for oil depletion, actually for the whole history of the oil uh, era, the oil industry, the oil experience, mankind's experience of oil was that, you know, you ramp up the, uh, you, you ramp up production, you, may, you get more and more of it, you dig more wells, it becomes a larger and larger enterprise, we use more and more oil. The first peak occurs, that's the U.S. peak. We, that's our, our production peak in 1970. Uh, the United States produced as much oil as it ever would again, about 10 million barrels a day, and then we, we uh, started declining. Meanwhile, the 1970s were a period of economic instability as a result of that, because all sorts of geopolitical things started to shift. The OPEC nations seized the pricing power in the oil industry, and we had trouble with the, the American currency and with high interest rates and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Then a couple of other things happened. There were the last, the latest and greatest new discoveries were made, and we started ramping back up the global oil um, uh, uh, arc. And um, now we are probably, theoretically, we're at the peak and maybe have just gotten over it in the last year or so. And um, this was the old model that the, the slope downward, the slope of depletion, would be fairly uh, a kind of mellow ride downhill. Things have changed. Well, the old theory was that um, you know, it, that it was based on the idea, which was the American, the USA's experience, that if, you, if your oil production was going down, you could compensate by importing from other nations. And that's what we did in the USA, including you, our number one donor. And what we've discovered is that when, the, when you reach the global peak, you can't uh, import oil from other planets. And so the implication of this, you know, there are implications to all these things. The implication of this is that the trip down the, the, the arc of depletion is not going to be as smooth as people thought. In, in fact, it's liable to be a lot quicker, a lot harsher, a lot more severe, a lot more chaotic and disorderly as uh, we get into trouble uh, with international oil supplies. So uh, 
I think what we're going to see is a convergence and a mutual um, uh, destabilizing of the, the important activities that make up everyday life for us. Uh, I'm going to zip through these things fairly quickly. One unalterable fact is that we just have never, we, we stopped discovering more oil than we use every year around the early 1980s. Ever since then, we've been using more oil than we find every year, and, and the gap gets wider and wider to the extent that it's insignificant now. The amount that we find is insignificant. The great new discoveries made in the last, just in the last year, in particular, the one made, announced three weeks ago by British Petroleum for deep water Gulf of Mexico oil. You know, this is about maybe three billion barrels of recoverable oil, which is about as much uh, oil as the USA uses in about four to five weeks. So, you know, this is not going to rescue Walt Disney World. We need to find the equivalent of a new Saudi Arabia every year to keep pace with where we're at now. That doesn't even include growing populations uh, around the world. This gives you an idea from the USA point of view of how severe American oil uh, depletion has been. This is the North Slope of Alaska, which was one of the latest and the last and great uh, oil finds. There's a new, there, there are many new subplots developing in the oil story, and one of them is called the, uh, the oil export crisis. And the idea is that the oil exporting nations are using more of their own oil, their populations are growing, they're selling more cars, like in Russia and Saudi Arabia, they subsidize the cost of gasoline in Venezuela and Iran. They're using much more of their own oil, even while many of them are in depletion. And what we're discovering is that their export rates are going down more steeply than their depletion rates. And this is going to be increasingly a problem for the USA. I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Oil nationalism is a companion to this problem. Only about 7% of the oil in the world is produced by the old major oil companies. The rest of it is produced by state-owned oil companies. Uh, like uh, Aramco in Saudi Arabia and Pemex in Mexico and Petrobras in Brazil, and they increasingly want to do business differently. Uh, many of them want to make special favored uh, customer contracts with, uh, with uh, special nations. Um, they don't want to put their oil on the auction block uh, of the futures markets, and it's changing the way that the markets operate. And they're also obviously using it as a political lever to moderate and influence the behavior of their friends and adversaries. And this is going to be increasingly a problem, and it will converge also with the oil export problem. Um, there's a great wish down in the USA that, that the tar sands will allow us to continue running Walt Disney World, but it's not likely to happen for reasons you're probably aware of. You know, you're not likely to produce more than three or four million barrels a day out of there, you know, for technical reasons, environmental reasons. And um, uh, then there's, there's always the question of whether you want to just all piss it away selling it to us. The shale gas uh, miracle du jour is the idea that, uh, you know, stranded gas in, in non-porous, difficult to rock, uh, a rock that is difficult to extract gas from is going to save us because we've discovered a new way of fracturing the rock and sucking all the gas out. Um, there are problems too complex to go into right now, um, except to say we're probably going to be disappointed about how that works out. And it's probably not going to happen at current gas prices or nearly close, anywhere close to what they are. One of the things that fascinates me, since I, I'm... Um, uh, uh, very interested in the diminishing returns of technology and how much we ignore this, especially among the techno-triumphalists out there, is what, how you see this is applied to the oil industry. And, you know, you take, for example, the North Sea oil fields, where, which were among the last great oil fields ever discovered, and we used all the latest and greatest techniques to get the oil out you know, injecting nitrogen into the rock and doing horizontal drilling to get to all the pockets and jamming in seawater to get more oil out. And uh, the, the main result of that is that we only manage to deplete it more efficiently. 
Okay, so that the UK went from being, uh, 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 from their, their oil production peak in 1999 to being net energy importers in 2005, and now oil importers, okay? So the diminishing returns of technology are tremendously important. Just a profile of where the North Sea fields are headed. It doesn't look very bright. I think, you know, we, the, you know, the UK has no idea what their economy is going to be in five or ten years. No idea what they're going to be doing. You know, maybe the Bronze Age again. For America, for the USA, the poster child for the export problem is Mexico, because Mexico is our number three source of imports. Um, the uh, uh, Mexican oil industry depends for m uh, more than half of its production on the Cantorell oil field, the second largest field ever discovered in the history of the oil industry. And um, it's depleting at a minimum of 15% a year. Mexican oil imports are down 30% year over year. And if you do this very simple math, what you discover is they're out. They're done in a few years. You know, they're certainly done as the USA's number three oil importer, uh, exporter, or, you know, sending oil to us in the USA. Um, and the most interesting thing about this is it is absolutely not under discussion at all in the United States. Nobody's talking about this or the implications of it. And by the way, the implications politically are that the Mexican government depends on uh, uh, Pemex for about 40 percent of its income. And um, as the government becomes impoverished and, and what, whatever there is of the social safety net in Mexico dissolves even further, you know, we're going we're gonna to see a lot of political mischief down there. The last time there was a, um, uh, an unstable political situation in Mexico was during their long revolution between 1913 and 1940. And a quarter of the population left. And the population then was about 22 million. Now it's about a, it's over a hundred million. So uh, we're in for, I think, some interesting developments there. Uh, most of the equipment that's used to drill for oil and store it and move it around is old and decrepit. It's over 40 years old. It has to be changed out at a, probably a cost of at least a trillion dollars. Almost, practically nobody in the oil industry wants to make any investments <clears throat> in more infrastructure because they realize they're in a twilight industry. They don't want to spend a trillion dollars, especially to get three quarters of a trillion dollars worth of gas out of the ground, if they even can do that, which is very doubtful. So um, we're going to see another problem develop with um, pipelines, tank farms, drilling rigs, um, refineries failing in the decade ahead, and that will only exacerbate all the other problems I've already described. Okay, now we're done with oil. Climate change. Uh, only one slide. It's very important. Go see Al Gore's movie. <laughs> so I, I've bundled, you know, you can do a whole three-day conference on, on climate change, obviously. I bundled all these ideas into the idea of the long emergency, which is, uh, you know, to, in my view, a period of hardship, a difficult transition. One of the really interesting things as I go around both the U.S. and Canada is that there's a huge number of people out there who assume that we're entitled to a smooth segue between where we are now and what our destination is. And, uh, you know, I just don't think that's true. What I think what we're going to see is a great deal of difficulty and uh, it's going to result in a lot of um, hardship. This has never been about running out of oil, the, this whole set of arguments. It's been about the failure of the complex systems that we depend on for daily life. And they can be described with some precision. The way that we produce our food, which is uh, industrial farming, you know, pouring a lot of oil and gas byproducts onto the soil. Um, to get all the corn to make all the cheese doodles and the Pepsi Cola. Okay, we're going to have trouble with that. The way we do commerce, big box shopping, national chain retail, et cetera, it has been a sort of a new phenomenon with mankind. It's, you know, the, we can see the horizon already where it's not going to work anymore. We're going to have to do that differently. We're done. We don't know that. By the way, a lot of these things I'm describing, we're done. We don't know it yet, but we're done. 
the way we move across the landscape in North America. Basically, happy motoring with the accessory of aviation. Okay? Um, we're going to have problems with both of those things. We don't know that yet. Most, you know, most people, most citizens don't have a clue. The way we inhabit the, the landscape, essentially suburban sprawl. Um, and the suburban sprawl issue is really at the heart of this problem. I describe it lately as the greatest misallocation of resources in the history of the world. And the reason you can say that is because it represents a living arrangement with no future. Uh, to, to make it worse, it provoked a very powerful psychology of previous investment, which has become the chief obstacle to us having a coherent discussion about what's happening to us and what we're going to do about it. The psychology of previous investment, which forces you more or less to remain paralyzed because you can't imagine letting go of the things that you've invested in. And in the case of the USA, you know, not only have we invested all of our post-war money <clears throat> in this way of living, but even our identity, you know, is locked up in this way of life. And so we can't bring ourselves to think about changing it, letting go of it, or even reforming it substantially. There are other elements of it that are simply tragic. A lot of people think we had a new economy. Uh, in the last 20 years, you know, an, an information economy, a post-industrial economy, a service economy, a digital economy. Uh, what we had was a suburban sprawl building economy. And that's why we had a housing bubble in the USA, and that's why it blew up. Because we devoted all of our investment down there for the last uh, 20 years when we weren't putting it into the military. We devoted all our investment to creating more stuff that has no future. So imagine how tragic that is and where it leaves us. Well, we're done. You know, I think a lot of people don't realize it. We're not going to do this anymore. And, and I dare say you're going to find that this is going to be a similar thing in, in Canada. And, and what's happening in the USA, of course, is so sort of both appalling and amusing is that the, the people who brought us this have kicked back and they're, they're now saying, well, we'll just wait till the bottom comes in, you know, and then we'll resume building the cul-de-sac sub subdivisions and all the other stuff. We're done. The suburban project is over. And for a new reason that's just come along just in the last, mm, you know, 18 months. There's no capital left. Okay? The money is gone. We can't even make, begin to think about making these investments, and there's no capital for people to even pay for these things. So we're done. We're done, and, and um, this is going to have some tremendous repercussions, but there's probably going to be a huge psychological overhang just in general in our culture about what the value of land is and the landscape and what it's for. We're going to have to use the land, the, the remaining undeveloped land around the places where people live for productive agriculture. We don't know that yet, because we're going to have to grow more of our food closer to home. Okay? And that's going to require us to change the way we think about the landscape and the way we value it. And we certainly are not going to be in a position to say, we value the landscape for its suburban development value. We're done, and we need to do something else with it. And we need to really consciously install that in the new consensus about what's happened to us and what we're going to do about it. Because one of the things we're going to do is we're not going to build any more houses. We've got to grow stuff on that land. There's understandably a wish to keep all the stuff running that we got up and running. That's the psychology of previous investment. But we're not going to run Wal uh, Walmart and Walt Disney World and the interstate highway system uh, on any combination of alternative fuels. No, on no combination of wind, solar, uh, uh, biodiesel, ethanol, dark matter, use French fried potato oil, nuclear. Um, the key to understanding this is that we're going to be disappointed by what all these things can do for us. They're not going to do for us what we're wishing that they can do for us, which is to keep all our stuff running just the way it's running. And that's mostly what's going on out there. And it's very disappointing. Um, I've gone to the Aspen Environmental Forum for the last two years the cream of the environmental movement in the United States, and some from Canada, too, 
internet, in fact, people from all over. The only conversation they want to have in the Aspen Environmental Institute is all the nifty new ways we're going to run our cars. I'm not kidding you. That's all they want to talk about. And that's not good enough. We've got to talk about a whole lot of other things, not just all the cool new ways you can run a car on peanut butter, ethanol, biodiesel, you know, electric, plug-in. It's, that's a, a, a conversation that's unworthy of people who are serious environmentalists. We've got to start talking about a lot of other things. And I, I don't want to be misunderstood either. I'm not against alternative energy. I'm not against alternative fuels and systems. But we've got, we got to really get real about how this is going to happen. And one thing is, it's not going to happen at the scale that we're thinking it's going to happen. Okay? The whole key to this is scale. We have to downscale virtually everything we're doing and probably relocalize uh, the things that we're doing. And, you know, we're probably not going to build that many Godzilla-sized uh, wind turbine farms. I think what you're going to see is we're going to do it on a local basis, on a household basis, on a district and neighborhood basis, but we're not going to do that. We're, the capital is gone for doing that. Okay? And we're also going to have problem, problems fabricating the, the, the stuff, making the, the equipment and the hardware with exotic uh, metallurgy and advanced fabrication techniques. It's going to be hard. We're going to have to start thinking very locally and very, very modestly about how we're going to do this. All right. This was the position, this is the basic mindset of the USA in the former era of the, the former Bush era, okay? I voted for Mr. Obama, but I, I need to point out things haven't changed that much. Ideologically, that's not very different from this. Here they said the American way of life is non-negotiable. Now we just won't apologize for it, okay? That's not good enough. The amount of delusional thinking that's being generated by this set of very vexing problems is staggering, and it's crippling us, and it's amazingly dumb. Um, I, I've told this story before, and uh, one or two of you may have heard it, but I'm going to tell it again because it's so shocking, you know. I was invited to go to the Google headquarters and give a speech three years ago in Silicon Valley. And I went to their headquarters, which was an office park building in the suburbs. And the building was tricked out like a kindergarten. Okay, they got foosball games and knock hockey and ping pong and video terminal vibrating chairs and lucite boxes full of gummy bears and yogurt covered pretzels and other wholesome sweets. <laughs> and the whole idea in American corporate life now is the more infantile you are, the more that means you're creative. That means that you're going to be a wonderful profit making company because you're so creative. You're like a child. Okay, so uh, that's how the, the headquarters is set up. And then the, the senior engineers and executives came into the auditorium and they were dressed like skateboard rats. You know, they, they're wearing sideways hats and their pants are hanging down so low that their ass crack is, is being on display. Senior executives, oh, we're childish, we're playful. So this is the highest level of American, you know, high-tech enterprise. And I, I, I gave my talk on energy, um, and at the end, we did questions at the end, and there were no questions, just, there were just 17 comments. It was all the same comment, which was, um, like, dude, we've got technology. Subtext, you're an asshole. We've got technology, dude. And what that clued me into was that they don't know the difference between technology and energy at the highest level of American corporate uh, high-tech enterprise. And that's shocking. They don't know the difference. They think if you run out of energy, just plug in technology. We're going to discover very painfully that it's not true, okay? And when we try to do, we try to do this. All right? You know, we're going to discover the hard way. These things will either run in liquid hydrocarbon uh, fuels or we're not going to have an airline industry. And the likelihood is we're not going to have an airline industry as we currently know it. You know, it will probably become an increasingly elite activity and then it won't exist at all. 
Okay? And by the way, you know, I was reflecting on why do the Google people even think this? You know, they're, they're, these are Stanford PhDs. What is their problem? You know, and I realized what was going on. You have a whole cohort of people who have become zillionaires at the age of 27 from pushing pixels around a screen with a mouse. So they develop this, you know, what I call techno-grandiosity. You know, the idea that you can solve absolutely every problem in the world from pushing a, you know, a mouse around and changing the pixels on the screen. And that's where we're at in the U.S. You know, we're suffering from this tremendous techno-triumphalism and techno-grandiosity, thinking that we'll just tech our way out of this set of problems. And we're going to be very disappointed, because we're going to have to make other arrangements for daily life. We're not going to tech our way out so that we can keep Walt Disney World and the interstate highway system and Walmart running the way they're running now. And this is sort of the, the bottom line for most people in the USA is like, well, you know, it makes my head hurt to think about this, but there's probably someone out there who's thinking about this for me, and they'll come up with a, the, the rescue remedy. Okay? Very unlikely. All right. So what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this set of problems, the tremendous civilization-threatening problems? And I think we have to begin with understanding we, have, we, we are in a generalized contraction. And we have to behave accordingly. We have to start downscaling and relocalizing. And that's going to be the key, I think, to being successful uh, in various places around the world. We'll be more or less successful depending on how much they get this and act accordingly. Uh, when I go around the country, there's a great clamor for solutions. Give us solutions. And people get really pissed off at me because I'm like, oh, you're, you're Mr. Gloom and Doom. Where's your solutions, dude? Okay. Well, I want, you, I want to urge you to think about this. Don't even use the word solutions. It's too grandiose. Because we don't know if we can solve the, these problems. I think we have to really start thinking about intelligent responses to the things that's happening, not s solutions. Because I'll tell you another thing that's really, this is really true. Whenever I hear that word solutions, it's always invariably in connection with the wish to keep all our stuff running. That's what they really want to solve. Give us solutions so we can keep on running Walmart and the interstate highway system and Walt Disney World. Okay? And if, if that's not your aim, or if, the, if you don't think that's going to work out, then you're Mr. Gloom and Doom. Okay? So we've got to stop, you know, being... We've got to stop clamoring for, getting hung up on clamoring for solutions. Because that, the solution to the happy motoring conundrum is the, let's say, the electric car. Oh, dude, everybody will have an electric car. Then the power will just come out of the wall. Because <laughs> we have technology. You know? The intelligent solution to this problem is maybe like walkable neighborhoods in proximity to productive farmland. Walkable towns, walkable human settlements in proximity to uh, uh, a a agricultural landscapes that, that are uh, designed correctly, that are used correctly. But that's not on the table. They're not talking about that at the Aspen Environmental Institute. They don't care about that. All they care about is getting a new kind of car. Okay, so we really got to stop that. We got to stop focusing on the car as being the beginning and end of civilization. And, you know, I think you can talk about these things pretty comprehensively and systematically. Uh, comprehensively and, and systematically. We basically have to form an intelligent response to downscaling and relocalizing all of the complex systems that are part of everyday life. And these are just some of the big ones. Agriculture in upper right, the way we do trade and commerce, the way we do schooling, how and whether we're going to ever make anything again in North America, and how we're going to inhabit the terrain. You know? What is, how are we going to do this? Well, we're very lucky that the new urbanists came along 20 years ago. And their great achievement, by the way, was not building the so-called, you know, new urbanist traditional neighborhood projects. 
A lot of them were good. A lot of them were badly compromised. Some of them were terrible. Um, but their achievement was not in designing places like Markham. You know, Markham ended up being a fiasco. The great achievement of the new urbanists was they dove into the dumpster of history and they reclaimed a lot of methodology and principle that was thrown in the garbage by three generations of architects and urban designers. And they got that information back. And they, and they, and they really systematized it and organized it and, and disseminated it for free to anybody who wanted it. And it's now become the basis of the next generation of urban designers who, for the most part, have renounced the practices of the last 60 years and will do so increasingly. We'll see if they have jobs. But, you know, the implication of this is we're going to have to inhabit the landscape of North America in traditional, in a traditional manner. Towns, neighborhoods, villages, cities, cities that will not be quite like the cities we have now, and uh, a rural, productive uh, agricultural landscape, and, and also other kinds of rural or wild landscapes, because there's not only one type of non-urban landscape. And, you know, we are fortunate at least east of the Mississippi to have models for how these, these things should be designed and assembled in our pre-existing, pre-World War II towns, villages, neighborhood cities. We've got to pay attention to the fabric we have that was there and start to learn from these places. Because that's how we're going to have to do it again, on a much smaller, fine, smaller uh, 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 scale and a much finer grain. We're going to have to grow our food differently, probably on smaller farms, probably requiring more human attention, probably with people living in the agricultural landscape differently than they do now. And we may even use more animals in the process. Um, uh, we don't know whether it will be 5% or 35% or 75%, but we'll probably use more animals. You know, there's another thing going on with agriculture that's very important. You know, most people concentrate on, uh, when you reflect on the problems of industrial agriculture, the main problems that come to mind are the immense amount of oil and gas byproducts that are required to make it work. You know, the herbicides and the fertilizers, et cetera. But there's a new one that's now entering the picture that's really going to screw things up, okay? The, the, the other ver very huge input in agriculture is capital. Capital. People who farm in the industrial manner have to borrow huge amounts of money every year to put their crops in. And we're going to see increasing problems with farmers, uh, at any scale really, farmers getting loans. And that's going to, that's going to be a huge problem, especially at the, 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 uh, the large level. We're going to have to reconstruct local networks of economic interdependency, the very ones that were destroyed by the national chain stores. We don't know how that's going to happen yet. And, and here I would remind you that human uh, uh, social, uh, human societies are fundamentally emergent and self-organizing. They respond to circumstances and things happen. You know, we won't necessarily know how this stuff is going to work out. No one can stand here right now and say, how are we going to reconstruct these local networks of commerce and trade that were very rich and fine-grained and multi-layered? And they're gone. We have no idea how we're going to rebuild them. They will get rebuilt, but they're going to be rebuilt uh, organically and emergently. Um, we're going to have to make some things in North America again. We can't keep on importing uh, plastic salad forks from 12,000 miles away forever, you know. And we may not make ours out of plastic anymore. But if, you, if we're going to have any household products of any kind, even the most rudimentary, we're going to have to start thinking about making them again. And we'll probably have to do it at a smaller and more modest scale than we did in the 20th century. We don't know yet. We'll see how that works out. And I don't have the answers for all these things. But, but a lot of people around the country, including the Aspen Environmental Institute, they're not even thinking about this now. Because all they're thinking about is, how are we going to keep all the cars running on something other than gasoline? Schooling, big problem. You know, down in the USA, one of the biggest focuses of, the, of our misinvestments, of our massive misinvestments, was in the centralized school districts. 
in, in pouring huge amounts of money into gigantic schools that drew students from a 75-mile radius, uh, and we're going to have trouble uh, running those schools. The yellow school bus fleets aren't going to work after a certain point in the oil story, and we have no idea how we're going to educate our kids. What I think you'll see is probably is homeschooling aggregating into larger units and then becoming institutionalized. But what we're probably not going to be able to do is deploy a whole new parallel set of smaller schools more equitably around the places where people live, because we're not going to have the capital to do that. We've got to rebuild the railroad system in North America or we're not going anywhere, okay? And, and the fact that we're not even talking about this, either in Ottawa or Washington, shows how unserious we are. We're not serious. You know, we don't understand how crucial this is because the airlines are not going to be doing their thing in five or ten years. You know, they're done. And this is a very large continent, and we are two very large, geographically large nations. And unless we get passenger railroads running again, and another thing is, you know, as part of our techno-grandiosity. Now, you've got a slightly, simil uh, a slightly different situation here. M much of Canada is essentially linear, you know. So you've got like one corridor basically for everywhere. But um, uh, I think that it's a mistake to focus on high-speed rail. I don't think we're going to have the capital to do it. It requires a parallel rail system because the high-speed trains require different um, curve ratios and grades and things. We need to get the existing railroad system back into service before we move on to high speed. You know, we now have a railroad system that the Bulgarians would be ashamed of, okay? And we have to get back to the Bulgarian level before we try to emulate Germany and Japan and China. And we're just not ready to do that. It's terribly important. It's got to become a political issue. It would put scores of thousands of people to work at meaningful jobs at all level and levels, and it would benefit people in all levels of society, and it would have another very important consequence. This is a project that we can actually do. We can accomplish this, and in doing that, we can demonstrate to ourselves that we're competent, that we're capable of meeting these, these problems that are coming down on us, and we can build our confidence to go on and do the other things that we have to do. So we should get on, on this project right away. A very interesting element of the happy motoring story about how it's failing is just sort of emerging in a very interesting way. You know, people, a lot of people like me who have been writing about the oil crisis and, and uh, peak oil and, and all of the problems associated with it. I think we, we assumed that the oil problem would just keep on getting worse and worse and that would finally put an end to the happy motoring system. But something else new has entered the picture that's really a surprise is that the happy motoring system is now failing on the basis of finance, not on fuel. Because there's so little capital left in the system that people get, can't get car loans anymore. Certainly not at the volumes that they need, that we need to uh, keep them at to keep that the system of selling cars intact. And as this occurs, and as you know, as we discover that there's that we have this inability to lend money on the grand scale to people to buy the numbers of cars that they have to buy, that's going to be a huge problem. Okay, so fewer and fewer people will be will get access to the to entering the system. But another thing is also happening, at least down in the USA, big surprise in a way, is that the insolvency of governments at all level, local, state, federal, the insolvency of governments is now so extreme that we're pro it mean, what it means is we're probably not going to be able to take care of the massive roadway infrastructure that we've built which is so enormous. And, it had, you know, I talked to a lot of traffic engineers when I wrote um, The Geography of Nowhere and Home from Nowhere. And they, made, they impressed me with one very, very uh, important point. They said that unless you maintain the highways immaculately, they fall apart really quickly, especially in places where, the, where it freezes a lot. You know, where the water gets into the, once, once the first little fissures form in the pavement and the first little potholes form, if you don't fix them pretty quickly, the road is toast in a couple of years. 
And that's, I think, what we're going to see increasingly, an inability to keep up with the maintenance of the massive highway infrastructure we've created. We're going to have to move more things on boats and trains. And another really interesting thing, okay, in the cities around uh, North America, no thought whatsoever about replacing the infrastructure for maritime trade. You know, and we're going to have to do this. You know, all we do is build condos and bikeways and festival marketplaces and stadiums and theaters on the waterfronts. We're going to have to rebuild the piers and the warehouses and the sleazy accommodations for the sailors. <laughs> or we're not going to be moving anything anywhere. But we're not, you know, that's totally off the radar screen. We're not thinking about that at all. This whole situation is going to produce a whole a huge number of losers, economic losers, and they're going to be very ticked off. And I'm waiting for the, really the next iteration of this is going to be in about, I don't know, five weeks when Goldman Sachs announces its gazillion dollar bonuses to their employees at the same time that half the people in Michigan are being thrown out on the street. That will make for a very interesting Yuletide. Well, this is decomplexifying and uh, uh, relocalizing the hard way, okay, having guerrilla war. This is not something we want to happen in North America. So if we want to avoid this, we have to start thinking more intelligently and responsibly uh, and responsively to the things that are happening. One of the, probably the focuses of social unrest will come from the agricultural problem. Um, for one thing, a whole lot of people who thought they were going to be marketing directors for the Gap are going to find that they're working in agriculture in their mature life. Uh-oh, wasn't expecting that. Um, that. And they're going to be very ticked off about it. They're not going to be happy about it. Um, but we also have no idea what the social relations are going to be between the people who maintain wealth in land after the wealth in paper you know, financial securities goes, you know, into a black hole. Uh, uh, the people who retain wealth and land will be people who have something of value. And they're going to be very resented by the people who have lost everything. I love these uh, pictures of the future done by, uh, you know, sci-fi guys from, from uh, the mid-20th century. They always absolutely get it wrong, right? Like in, in this one, the idea of what the future would be like in 1956, they thought that in the year 2030, everybody would be driving 1958 Ford Fairlanes. <laughs> right? That's how lame we are. And the, th yeah, the thinking that's going on right now about what, the, you know, what is the city of the future, I think is, is, uh, is not very accurate, doesn't comport with the reality that's coming at it. So it's going to be very different. I do believe we're going to see very severe demographic shifts ahead. Suburbia is going to fail massively. And people are not going to be able to, people are going to be leaving it incrementally. But where are they going to go? They're not all going to go to Toronto. And they're not all going to go to Boston and Houston and Seattle, etc. I think you'll see something very different going on. Because these cities are not scaled to the uh, energy realities of the future. In fact, they're, they're, they're no better scale to that than the suburbs are. They're going to contract, and they're going to contract substantially, and the process is going to be disorderly, and it's going to produce a lot of heat and friction, and maybe even violence. But these shifts are going to occur, and what I predict that you're going to see is that our cities are going to contract, they're going to densify and redensify if they've been, if they've emptied out along their old centers and their waterfronts, and just about everything else beyond that is going to become dodgy, contested territory, you know, nebulous, ambiguous territory. Um, I think the places where the action will be will be on the neighborhood level, the district level. Places like Toronto may disaggregate back into, into more or less independent districts, you know, assuming that it, it can happen in anything approaching an orderly way. But also the smaller cities and the smaller towns and the places that have a meaningful relationship with productive agriculture, because that's going to be hugely important in the years ahead. Um, 
I think we're also going to see the agricultural landscape inhabited differently. And we're going to see the, re the return or the rebirth or maybe the reinvention of what is in effect a new agricultural village, small town, hamlet that exists in, because we're going to need more people to work in agriculture. So that's, that will be happening. Places where the action won't be, okay? Uh, uh, the excitement is over for everybody but the tarantulas. That, that's Las Vegas, by the way. Forget about it. They're done. Phoenix, don't think about retiring there or moving there. If your children are, have, are enjoying fantasies about going there, tell them to forget about it. Forget about this kind of arrangement. You know, there's another really big problem that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, I was talking about this earlier to uh, uh, Thomas Homer Dixon. Um, there's a fellow down in New York just uh, published a book saying that Manhattan is the greenest place to live in North America because you can stack so many people up on one building footprint in apartment towers. And what we're going to discover is that the, the, the tower building, the skyscraper, is a building typology whose days are over. They are completely a, a, a product of the cheap energy era, and we're not going to be able to use them. They're going to become increasingly a liability for the towns that have too many of them. And you shouldn't build any more of them at all. Um, and for reasons that, that actually um, would surprise you, because it's not just because of the energy reasons or, or the problems with uh, heating them or, or the amount of electricity needed to run them. The most interesting thing is they will never be renovated. They have one generation of life and then they're done because we're not going to have the resources to renovate them and we may not have the materials to renovate them. We may not have the stuff that you need to make the gaskets around the curtain wall uh, glass windows in the skyscrapers. Um, we may not have the, the um, trusses and things that you need to change. It. We're, we're probably not going to be able to structurally uh, uh, renovate these things in the sense of the, you know, the, the, the poured concrete columns and things. So they're going to fail on that basis. I actually saw the preview of coming attractions uh, earlier this year in Johannesburg where the entire corporate sector abandoned the downtown of Johannesburg in 1993. It was about the size and scale of Denver, about 30 blocks of ta glass tower buildings, completely abandoned Corporate South Africa went north to the, a suburban fortified uh, office park, or, or many of them. And the downtown skyscrapers were turned over to slumlords where they became slums. And so now you see laundry hanging out the 38th floor of the window. The elevators work when they feel like working, which is maybe twice a week. You know, so that if you're living on the 27th floor, guess what? If you want to leave your apartment more than once a day, you're going to be walking up and down every time you do it. So that's the destiny of the tower building, and you can go see it now in, in Johannesburg. So I urge you, especially if you're urban planners, is to forget about the tower, forget about the skyscraper. We're going to need to rethink what urban scale is, and it's probably going to be a lot more modest, you know, just as a... As a uh, uh, a benchmark, you could probably say that Haussmann uh, and Napoleon III had it right in Paris, where they dis decided that seven stories was the furthest you could ask people to walk upstairs reasonably. You know, and then Paris became zoned vertically with the less affluent people living on the seventh and sixth floor and the more affluent people living further, closer to the ground. And these are, you know, w in the best with the best outcome, our cities will be smaller, more integrally um, designed and assembled so that all of the organs of civic life operate correctly. And, um, but we don't really know uh, how we're going to get there. You know, we're, if you go to Europe, what you see is that the, they never suffered this discontinuity. You know, their idea of what urban life should be has remained fairly consistent even through the calamities of the 20th century. So that the new projects that are being done by the current new urbanists of Europe are indistinguishable from the old fabric in Europe. And this is a new project that's being done in the Netherlands. You know, you can't really tell the difference between this and any, uh, anything else in a Dutch city. 
Um, we have a long way to go in North America. We have a long way to go to reclaim especially the idea of what the public realm should be and its importance to us and the need to embellish it and honor it in order to make it a viable dwelling place for your community life. And all we've succeeded in doing in the last hundred years is turning North America, North American cities into uh, national automobile slums. But we're going to get this back. It's just going to be very difficult. You know, we, we've spent the last 50 years designing, you know, 60,000 places that aren't worth caring about. And when you have enough places that aren't worth caring about, you have nations that aren't worth defending and cultures that are not worth bringing into the future. And this obviously has um, dreadful implications for us. But, you know, so another thing that, that um, certainly the university audiences don't really get uh, is life is tragic. Life is tragic. And history doesn't care if we pound our civilization down a rat hole. So we really have to be responsible, actively responsible for this. You know, all over the USA, and in the, you know, I've been to a few Canadian colleges lately too, the theme is, you know, give us hope. The young people want hope. That's why Mr. Obama was elected, because he promised people hope. And I think the young people especially are going to have to discover that hope is not something that is given to them by a politician or a corporation or anybody else. You know, the hope is something that you generate inside yourself by demonstrating to yourself that you're competent, that, you're, that you understand the signals that are coming to you from the universe, and that you can respond to them intelligently. And when you can do that, and you can act, res uh, uh, you can respond intelligently to these things, then you can become a confident person. And when you're confident, you become hopeful, because you have reason to believe that you can affect what is happening to you and your community and your culture in the future. So I'm going to leave you with that thought and with an advertisement for my last book, World Made by Hand, was a novel written in the post-oil USA future, set in... Uh, rural New York State, in a small town, New York State. And I'll just leave this up. If we have time for Q&A, I think it was on the schedule, uh, I'll be happy to do that. I'll leave this up. If you don't want to stick around, um, no problem, just leave. If you do want to stick around, we'll just do questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do have time for questions and answers. We have about 10 minutes, and I will moderate that. I will leave you very briefly. Uh, Jim mentioned, actually, people don't get it, the Google example. I've seen that. You might also be aware, this is not Jim's doing, the people who put up his uh, presentation at uh, TED, TED in San Diego, the first thing you do when you click on that is an advertisement, the sponsor, BMW. Yeah. So, you know, this is sort of a constant problem. So what I will be doing is I will turn the microphone back over to Jim. I will sort of circulate in the audience and pick people up. If you want to ask questions, please just raise your hand. If you are asking a question, please, of course, raise your voice so, so Jim can hear it, obviously, and the rest of the audience can do so. So I'll sort of turn the podium back over and moderate here. Are there questions, ladies and gentlemen? Well, I'm a cheerful fellow. Um, no, my personal, my personal strategy at the really personal level is to lead a rewarding and fulfilling life by pursuing the things that uh, are meaningful to me. And I'm I I've been either lucky or successful in being able to do that. I do fly in airplanes. I have mixed feelings about it. But uh, I do feel that there's value for me doing it now and that the airplane industry is not going to rise or fall necessarily because of me, or, nor is the, the climate necessarily going to be affected whether I make that choice or not. That, that plane was going to leave Albany today whether I was on it or not.
big city centers filling in and redesigning themselves. Why can't suburbia be organized in the same way as separate towns? Well, I think, that there, I think that you won't see a uniform outcome in all of suburbia is the answer to that. There will be very different outcomes in different places. Some, some of these places will lend themselves to retrofit in one way or another. Um, but many of them won't. And my guess is that most of the fabric of suburbia won't. Some of it will, will, will be retrofitted. Most of it will have the outcome of becoming either slums, salvage, or ruins. But, you know, but the idea, there, there, there's, you know, the idea that it is all retrofittable, I think, I put that in the folder of techno-triumphalism. And also, you know, the idea that um, uh, we can, that we're so omnipotent that we can organize our way out of this with no, with no losses. Because there will be losses. And, you know, one of the most obvious losses is, is already begun and is hugely underway, and that is both the monetary uh, devaluation of suburban property and, it, and its uh, growing loss of utility. They're both self-evidently occurring massively right now. And, uh, you know, and by the way, in some places in the country where the climate uh, uh, is unfavorable, in Florida, for example, if you leave a house without, with no one living in it for about three months, it's ruined because mold gets into the sheetrock, and if you're not air conditioning it and sucking the water out of the interior every day, mold gets into the sheetrock, and you have to demolish the house, which costs more than the value of the land that it's on. So, you know, that magnifies the amplitude of, of the real estate, the sheer monetary fiasco of what's going down. And that's apart from the sheer utility fiasco of living the way they live in Florida. Well, there, there's, I think, um, a line of belief about generational moods and dispositions. You know, one of the books written about that was a book called The Fourth Turning by Howe and Strauss, which was, uh, which was not, it was not, as it might appear, um, you know, uh, uh, a New Age book. It was just about a generational theory of history. And to make it short, uh, uh, the young generation now, which he calls the millennials, he considers to be uh, primed for, uh, to, to play a heroic role in, uh, in their culture. And I think that uh, you will be heroic, but you'll probably be, um, you'll, you'll have very different attitudes than the boomers who, you know, uh, produced you. Uh, the, po the boomers suffer from a great many ideological problems right now. Um, and um, they think that they're going to be treated fairly, by, you know, especially as they grow old. And I think that they're going to be treated very harshly. Uh, and I think that you're going to be the ones who do it. And as I said, life is tragic. Well, sure. No, well, first of all, I think you're misunderstanding me. I, did, I do not mean to say that everybody's going to move from the city to the rural landscape. That would be a misunderstanding of what I said. And I, I did not talk about population. Um, and I generally don't because um, there's not much you can really say about what we're going to do because we're not going to do anything. We're not going to do anything about population. And if, if anything was done about population, I guarantee you nobody in the room would like it. But what I think you'll see is along the lines, I mean, what are we going to do? You know, 
tyrannically and despotically impose uh, birth limits on everybody. That's probably not going to happen in, you know, in, in, in this part of the world. Um, are we going to kill all, every, uh, the eldest female child in the family? I don't think so. No, I think what you'll see is what, what you got with the coming attractions in the fall of the Soviet Union, where for a period of about 15 years, 20 years, the population went down a lot. You know, they had a huge attrition. They've lost probably a total of about 30 million people in, in Russia without the other Soviet republics alone. And there were no screaming headlines the whole time. So, you know, you didn't wake up in the morning, look at the Toronto Star and see a headline that said, another 500,000 lost in Russia. You know, they just fell through the cracks. You know, the people who made the wrong choice of becoming alcoholics, you know, the people who, you know, got, got AIDS from using dirty, dirty needles, you know, whatever happened, they fell through the cracks and they, they, they went away. I think you're going to see a lot of attrition. I think the usual suspects will come into play, starvation, violent conflict, uh, disease, poverty, compromised immune systems, etc. cetera. Uh, but Getting back to the first thing, no, I'm not saying that everybody will leave the city and move to the country. It's not, this isn't the hippie era revisited. We're going to see a dispersion of people, I think, going back to a lot of different places. And, the, and I believe the places that w will be most favorable will be the places that are scaled properly and the places that are, exist in relationship to agriculture and fresh water. And that's one of the reasons I'm more optimistic about the Great Lakes area than I would be about, uh, you know, Alabama and uh, Arizona. Uh, yes and no. I think that that's, that's um, to a certain extent, a wishful boomer fantasy. Um, what the, the, the fantasists fail to recognize is that Cuba went through its bottleneck at a time when the rest of the world was intact. And uh, not only was, was globe, the global economy still going strong when they went through that, but they were receiving lots of remittances from the United States. So to suggest that the scenario is going to be the same for everybody else, I think, is, would be to misunderstand the situation where you're going to be living in a world where there's a lot more distress, a lot fewer things be getting around, a lot of resource scarcity everywhere, a lot of contests for resources between large, large nations. And I don't think it's going to be the same outcome. But they were very lucky that they went through that then. But, you know, I hear this fantasy all the time, oh, if we could only be Cuba. You know, boomers are ridiculous. And I apologize for my generation with all their bullshit. Uh, how about Singapore? How about Singapore? They, they make a great noodle dish. Yeah. I've had it many times. Well, it's a city. Well, Singapore is a very unusual city-state. Um, you know, it is organized differently. It's ruled, uh, you know, very, very despotically. And um, it's probably not going to operate at the scale that it was designed to operate. But, you know, it may be doing better for the moment. Well, absolutely. I think, it, it, you know, one of the big issues right now in the USA and maybe for Canada is how is capital allocation going to occur in local communities, not just in Goldman Sachs? Because what's going on right now, there's like four places that are accumulating capital in the United States. Everybody else is being impoverished. And we need to uh, accumulate and deploy the capital locally. And that's, well, that was, the, that was the, the wonderful thing about North America, you know, before 1960 or 1970.
Well, I think that there is very, very little capital left in, uh, in the United States. There's very, very little capital left locally in, in an awful lot of places. They don't have anything, and they're not producing anything of value. Uh, I'm serious. We're, there is very, very little capital there. And, and the capital that had been there, that had been around, the notional capital is being sucked out of the universe. Um, it's really more a question of, of how are places like Akron, Ohio, and uh, Gloversville, New York, going to produce anything of value, whether it's, you know, farm commodities or making a broom or anything. We, we really don't have the answer to that. Well, that's good, and I'm glad you guys are talking about it. It wasn't popular in, in, in Aspen. So are you in favor of, A, more suburban expansion, and B, even a larger uh, Toronto metropolitan area? Okay, well, we'll see how it works out. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jim will be available for a brief time afterwards, uh, after we do the last little bit, which is uh, Deep's going to be up here doing alumni. I do want to present, actually, Jim with a gift. We actually did buy you something. Oh, yay. It's, uh, yes, he says yay, actually. It's actually hopefully a little more than a uh, round trip to Walt Disney or a Walmart gift certificate. So, Jim, thank you very much. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.